Lord be with you. I think I'm on. There we go. Uh, there are three, three things going on today. Of course, it's Memorial Day weekend, so we will have, uh, uh, remember our, our um, service people and our veterans and our prayers. It is Pentecost. So we are going to have a video, which is a dramatic reading of Acts chapter 2. And then our theme for Upon This Rock Celebrate Mission happens to be Nurture Youth. So remember those things. And um, Chris is going to come up here and... Uh, give a little bit of a temple talk, and while he's coming up and getting the microphone, let me just remind you that on June 14th, there will be a picnic, Messiah pickup picnic, and I'm going to ask you to sign the um, sign-up sheet. We just want to have a little bit of a head count so we can have a somewhat accurate count on food. Also, on that day, uh, we're asking for um, pledge cards to be in. So keep that in mind, too. And there's a place to put those if you wanted to even put it in there today. Chris. Good morning. I think this is on. There we go. Well, as Pastor said this week, we are focusing on the nurture youth portion of our mission strand. And uh, as I was preparing this week, um, I just got really focused on what Nurture Youth was about. And um, I was really reminded about the in intricacy of uh, the term Nurture Youth. And it's really easy to focus on, there we go, the youth portion of that statement. Um, but I looked deeply into the word nur Nurture, and the word Nurture is synonymous for a few words that really caught my attention. Words like care, and words like discipline, education, feed, rearing, sustenance, training, and upbringing. And if you look closer at some of these words, the word discipline means to instruct in a way that is right in accordance to practice. The word feed means to provide with the necessar necessary materials for development, maintenance, or operation. Sustenance is means of sustaining life and means of livelihood. And rearing means to take care of and support up to maturity. All of these words put emphasis not on our young people, but on the people who are actually doing the upbringing. And as King Solomon said, the wisest king in the Bible said in Proverbs, if you train up a child in the way they should go, and when they are old, they will not depart from it. So as parents, as mentors, simply as men and women of God, we have a clear instruction on how to act 
We are to be the prime example in the lives of this next generation of Messiah. We are the legacy that will break, make or break the success of Messiah. And, and what an honor it is to, during this capital campaign for us to instruct our next generation on the importance of making pledges. How important is it for them to see and understand why we continue to support something, not just halfway through, but through to its completion? But it's our privilege, not only a responsibility, but more so it's our privilege to cultivate them in a practice that will continue with them all the days of our lives. And so as you go through the rest of this service and we hear the words nurture youth, think about the things that we can put and impart in our children's lives, not just training them up, not just disciplining them, but putting them on the path of success, showing them what it means to support Messiah. And uh, as we continue on this capital campaign, let that be the pledge that you give, not just building, not just putting money into the building, but training up the child in the way that they should go. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. <coughs> now, Acts 2. When the Feast of the Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Without warning, there was a sound like a strong wind, gale force. No one could tell where it came from. It filled the whole building. Then, like a wildfire, the Holy Spirit spread through their ranks and they started speaking in a number of different languages as the Spirit prompted them. There were many Jews staying in Jerusalem just then, devout pilgrims from all over the world, when they heard the sound that came on the run. Then when they heard one after another their own mother tongues being spoken, they were thunderstruck. They couldn't for the life of them figure out what was going on and kept saying, aren't these the Galileans? How come we're hearing them talk in our various mother tongues? Their heads were spinning. They couldn't make head or tail of any of it. They talked back and forth, confused. What's going on here? Others joked, they're drunk on cheap wine. And that's when Peter stood up and backed by the other 11, spoke out with bold urgency. Fellow Jews! All of you who are visiting Jerusalem, listen carefully and get this story straight. These people aren't drunk, as some of you suspect. They haven't had time to get drunk. It's only nine o'clock in the morning. This is what the prophet Joel announced would happen. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on every kind of people. Your sons will prophesy, also your daughters. Your young men will see visions. Your old men dream dreams. When the time comes, I'll pour out my spirit on those who serve me, men and women both, and they'll prophesy. I'll set wonders in the sky above and signs on the earth below. Blood and fire and billowing smoke. The sun turned black and the moon blood red. Before the day of the Lord arrives, the day tremendous and marvelous, and whoever calls out for help to me, God, will be saved. Please rise and sing.
Living together in trust and hope, we proclaim our faith. We believe in one God in three persons, a triple bloom on a single stem. God the Father, who created the universe and is continually creating us. God the Son, who redeemed us by coming and pitching his tent next to ours. God the Holy Spirit, who strengthens us and is the love that gives our life meaning. We worship one God in three, and three in one, and this belief is life everlasting. our sin in the presence of God and one another. Almighty and merciful God, you established your church with the power of the Holy Spirit. Fill us with that sacred fire that we may ignite with a passion for your will. Inflame our hearts to do good works in the building of your church. Finally, burn down the walls that keep us from you. These things we ask in your name. The experts tell us that with youth ministry, with youth, we want our children to be just religious enough to be good people, but not religious enough that they won't be successful. This is one of our many, many sins. So we come before God asking for forgiveness, and God is gracious and merciful, always showing mercy. And God says to us today, for the sake of Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
gospel this morning is from Mark chapter 10. People were bringing little children to Jesus in order that he might touch them, and the disciples spoke sternly to them. But when Jesus <coughs> saw this, he was indignant and said to them, let the little children come to me. Do not stop them, for it is to such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. Truly I tell you, Whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. And he took them up in his arms, laid his hands on them, and blessed them. The gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. I would like to invite the children to come forward. Boy, am I glad you came this morning, and you'll be so glad too. We're going to play ball, okay? So I'm going to bounce the ball. All right, Henry? It's not bouncing very well. What's wrong with this ball? It's not blown? It's flat. What does it need? Oh, it needs air. My big ball has air. Your big ball has air? You know my big ball. I don't know that ball, but I, I believe you that it has air. So you're saying this does not have air. Do you know what the word for air is in Greek? Yes, Greek. It is pneuma. We get our word pneumonia. You know when a person has pneumonia? It has to do with their air or their breathing, their breath. Do you know what the... You have a boo-boo, yes. <laughs> do you know what the word for spirit is? Boy, you, that is a boo-boo too. Okay, do you know what the word for spirit is in Greek? It is pneuma. So the word for spirit is the same word that we use for breath is the same word we use for air. Isn't that interesting? How about Hebrew? What's the word for wind or air? It is ruach. Ruach. In fact, you have to say it in a way that you sort of spit at people. Ruach. And then, but it's also the same name for wind and air and spirit. So what you're saying is that this ball needs a little spirit, right? I've got just the thing.
I went to my son's house this morning to let the dogs out since he's gone, and I took his air pump. And this is a spirit sprayer. Hear that? See how the air comes out? Isn't that pretty neat? So I'm going to put some spirit into that ball. Here we go. Tell me when I have enough. Now I will, Dad. Are you sure, Henry? Okay, we'll see. You are right. Can you do that? Sure. <laughs> All right. All right, one more time, Henry. That's pretty good. Okay, here's, here's the point. Today is the day of Pentecost, the day that the Holy Spirit blew on the church. And it blew, it blows on each of us, the Holy Spirit. And it gives us some bounce. It gives us life. Okay? It lets us know God is alive in us and working and giving our lives bounce. What's that? Is this mine? You better believe it. Whose else would it be? The Holy Spirit gives us life. Okay? Helps us bounce. Let us pray. Repeat after me. Gracious God, we thank you for the Holy Spirit. We thank you for your life in us. Help us believe. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, thanks for coming. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. <clears throat> well, today we are talking about nurturing youth and we're going to talk about Pentecost at the same time. And what it is, what is it that we want our youth to know as they grow up in Messiah Lutheran Church? Nurture youth. We are both... And, and the Lutheran Church has always been about faith formation. Faith formation. We want our children to grow up with faith. We believe the Holy Spirit works in the church to make sure that happens. And we want our children to know that the Holy Spirit works here in the church at Messiah Lutheran Church. It works when they leave here, works in their lives, but the Holy Spirit works here in the church. And we do love children. Last night, the Saturday night worship service was very tested on that. We don't normally have children, especially two young children, where it was only their second time ever to be in a worship service. You know what it's like when you're that little and you don't know how to act? It was good for everybody. Here's the problem. And I, I, I mentioned it to you when uh, a few minutes ago. Christian Century article had uh, an article by youth minister Mike Iaconelli. Mike Iaconelli has been a youth minister 
his entire career. He's written books on it. And he wrote this. He lamented, the one, the one problem in youth ministry is the relatively low number of parents who place faith development as a high priority for their children. And then he goes on. Today's parents are very much in favor of Christianity as long as they think it's going to make their kid into a nice person. But as soon as it becomes genuine Christian faith, they start to worry. That's because this generation of parents is very ambitious for their children and doesn't want anything to get in the way of their future success. To be too giving and too loving might not be too successful, huh? Which actually is not true. Lyle Schaller, he's in his 90s now, and Lyle Schaller has been a church consultant and a very good one for decades. And he writes this, What churches do people join? They join churches that answer their most pressing questions. And for people born since 1955, the most pressing question is not, what denominational label is on the sign out front? Instead, the most pressing concern is, can you help me find meaning in my life? I think that's a great concern. And the second, right behind it, can you help me raise my children? Well, we're in the faith development business. Hopefully, you'll develop some skills for raising children, but we're in the faith development. We want our children to know that God is working in us. The Holy Spirit is working in us and in our lives. And that something happens here in worship. Carl Barth, the, Carl Barth, the, the theologian, said it this way. He was talking about the creed. I, I believe in the Holy Catholic Church. And he asked, what does it mean to believe in the Holy Catholic Church? It does not mean that we believe in the church. It means rather to believe that God is present and at work in the church, that is, in this assembly. The work of the Holy Spirit takes place here, in this assembly. We do not believe in the church, but we do believe that in this congregation, the work of the Holy Spirit becomes an event. I think that every single time a child is baptized, and I truly believe God washes that child clean, claims that child as his own forever, and that we're all united together in the life, but also in the death of Christ, and truly united in the resurrection of Christ, just as Paul says in Romans 6. One more quote. Henry Nouwen, that uh, Dutch priest, he said, through baptism we are identified as children of God who are both loved and lovable, chosen by the Lord to be his people in the world. The truth, even though I cannot feel it right now, he was going through a downtime in his life, the truth, even though I cannot feel it right now, is that I am the chosen child of God, precious in God's eyes, called the beloved from all eternity, and safe in an everlasting embrace. What do we want our children to recognize? That God has chosen them as his own. They are a child of God, precious in God's eyes and they're being held safely in God's embrace. God is a work at work and alive in our lives, even when we leave this place. But when we come here, God's Spirit is a work at work and alive, working in us. Let me give you one example of how this happens. It's a story by Jeannie... Bishop. Jeannie Bishop was a public defender in Chicago. Jeannie Bishop, her, daughter, her, her, 
her sister, her sister Nancy, her brother-in-law Richard, and their unborn child were all senselessly murdered. They were murdered by a juvenile who was captured, convicted, given the sentence of life in prison without parole. Jeannie Bishop was a devout Christian. She was a Presbyterian. And she claimed that she forgave David Biro, her sister's murderer. She claimed she had forgiven him. Not only that, she wrote a book about it. Not only that, she toured not only this country but the entire world giving lectures on how she had forgiven the murderer of her sister Nancy, of Nancy's husband Richard, and of their unborn child. Until one day, she got the news that in Illinois, they were going to change the sentencing that they had given to juveniles and that they were probably going to eliminate life without parole. And all of a sudden, that set her world in turmoil because she had never spoken to David Biro. And she talked to a friend, and a friend said, haven't you told him you've forgiven him? And she goes, why should I even talk to him? He's remorseless. He, he claims he's innocent. And then she happened to go to worship at a different church. It happened to be an Episcopal church of all places. And it, it was a worship service on the beach. So there was the priest in his Birkenstocks sandals, his shorts, and his clerical collar, his black clerical collar, on the beach giving a sermon. And he was lamenting the fact that the Episcopal Church just had one of their uh, meetings like they have, and he was just plummeted with questions about why did they decide this? Why did they decide that? Why did they decide this? And he got up and said, I'm sorry. But the Episcopal Church is just a mess. And then he looked at the group and said, but mercy, mercy, mercy. How does God look upon us? With mercy, mercy, mercy. And Jeannie Bishop could only hear those words, mercy, mercy, mercy. And she said of that experience, the Holy Spirit, like the Spirit of God that moves like wind, blowing things open, shattering debris, wasn't done with me yet. In that church, on the beach, it was a pleasant change. But here I was, God's Spirit, saying, Mercy, mercy, mercy. And then she heard those words later in the service when it came to Holy Communion. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. And she said, what does that mean? Whatever it meant, I knew it couldn't mean me saying to any human being, we are taking the sin you committed and freezing it in time forever. No matter what you do, no matter how much you repent and show remorse, you are forever only one thing, a killer. And we will punish you endlessly for it, for this. I knew this in my heart. So the Holy Spirit was working. It was working in a worship service 
We could say in the church, on the beach, working in her heart to get her to change. So she decided she had to write a letter. She, for some reason, could not face David Bureau, but she felt she could write him a letter. So she write a, wrote him a letter, and she said there were two points that she made. The first was, you are no different in the eyes of God than I am. I am someone who has fallen short and hurt God's heart. I have sinned, to use that biblical word, just as you have sinned. You are a child of God, created in God's image, just as I am. God loves you every bit as much as me. Nothing you have done could ever stop God from loving you. The division I have made between us, you, a guilty murderer, me, an innocent victim's family member, was a false divide. Forgive me. I was wrong to do that. Then the second observation she wrote. When Jesus was on the cross, dying, he said, he prayed for his killers. Father, forgive them. They do not know what they are doing. And then she said, it struck me that I have never prayed for you. I've never even said your name. It was wrong of me. So I did pray for you. She said, I went to the place where my brother-in-law, my sister, and their unborn child were murdered. And I knelt down and I prayed for you. And then she finished her letter. The only thing that could possibly pay for the loss of Nancy, her husband, and her baby is this nearly impossible thing that you would make your way home to God the way of the prodigal son in one of Jesus' parables finds his way home. So she wrote that letter to David Bureau, sent it off, really not expecting an answer, even dreamt about him receiving the letter and just laughing in scorn. But a few weeks later, she received a manila envelope and it had a 15-page response. She couldn't look at it. She couldn't read it. She had a friend read it. And the friend said, no, no, this is good. And one of the things he wrote in that letter was this. I know that for a long time, you and your family have been looking for me to confess to the murders I committed years ago. Of course, as you know, in the past, I have always maintained my innocence. Well, for a lot of reasons, which I'll get into in a little bit, I think the time has come for me to drop the charade and finally be honest. You're right. I'm guilty of killing your sister Nancy and her husband, Richard. I also want to take this opportunity to express my deepest concern condolences and apologize to you. And when she heard that, she sobbed. Especially those words, you're right, I am guilty. What did that? The Holy Spirit working in Jeannie Bishop's life in a worship service on a beach. The neat thing about um, articles on the internet is that people can share their responses. And this is the response that someone shared. I teach a Bible study and I am a part of a group of Christians that bring Holy Communion to a maximum security prison. 70% of the men have committed murder. Every man who has spoken to me about this crime has said, you wouldn't recognize me if you met me when I first entered the prison system. All of the men I talk with are remorseful, and most can't forgive themselves because they don't know if their victims or even their victim's family could ever forgive them. I tell them they are created in the image and likeness of God, and when I look into their eyes, I see Christ looking back at me. 
your letter to David Bureau was beyond kind. You brought him out of the darkness into the light of Christ. But when we say we want to nurture youth, we want them to know the Holy Spirit works in this place, this place, works in their lives, their hearts. We want them to know that. Amen. that you let your spirit rest on us, on your church, like tongues of fire, to inspire us to do your will. Help us to be a place where our youth are nurtured and they grow in faith. Lord, in your mercy.
Creator God, how manifold are your works. In wisdom, you have made them all. We give you thanks for the creation as life takes root and grows, for the earth and all planets, for the sun, moon, and stars, for the natural wonders in, among, and beyond us. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for our world. We need your peace and your healing. Our world hurts from the spill of 1,000 100,000 gallons of oil from a broken pipeline all the way to the people of Rumadi, Iraq, now under the brutal control of ISIS. Give guidance to nations, international organizations, and especially to peacemakers. Lord, in your mercy. God of healing, send your Holy Spirit to those who long for healing. We remember especially John Burke, Mary Lou Cordero, Lindsay Dillian, Cliff Dykeman, Dennis Edwards, Jackson Gilbert, Karen Goulet, Dustin Jones, Frank Kimsey, Jim Lampy, Scotty Immen, Ellen Lassant, Alan Malcolm, Verdine Miller, Darren Murphy, Ruth Pipcorn, John Reynolds, Jan Snath, Wayne Sproul, Ed Wood, Harriet Smith, and Pat English. Are there any others? On this Memorial Day, we give you thanks for our nation and those who serve to keep it free. We give you thanks for veterans, military personnel, and those who advocate on their behalf. We remember saints led by your spirit, including scientist Nicholas Copernicus and Leonard Euler, whom we commemorate today. Comfort those who mourn. Lord, in your mercy. your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Holy God, breath of life and fire of love, with a mighty wind you brought creation into being, and by a pillar of fire you led your people into freedom. We praise you for the gift of your Son who poured out your Spirit on his disciples of every race and nation. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, gave it for all to drink saying, 
This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his death, resurrection, and the sending of the holy and life-giving Spirit, we await his coming again to renew the face of the earth. Send now your Holy Spirit upon us and upon this meal. Anoint us with your gifts of faith, hope, and love, that with thankful hearts we may be witnesses to your Son who taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. All is ready. Our Lord invites us. Please come. You may be seated.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, through the gifts of his body and blood, strengthen, keep, and unite us now and forever. Amen. Gracious <coughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you for this gift of life. We thank you for the work of your spirit in our lives. Send us from this place with the spirit working in us to bring your light into the darkness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now receive this benediction, <clears throat> the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the grace that sustains every breath we take, the love of God that gives us courage and strength, and the abiding presence of the Holy Spirit that fills our hearts with comfort and peace be with you and all those you care about now and forever. Amen.
Thanks to the Lord for 